welcome to Union Presbyterian Church. I offer thanks and praise to God for each and every one of you who can join us here this morning, live and in person, and those who are joining us on our um, Facebook Live feed as well. We begin our time together with some announcements. First of all, um, we I do want to remind you that the Deacon Hoagie sale is coming up. There are some order forms in the back. I'm going to start with all my loose papers first and then set them aside. So you can grab a deacon order form. We're also going to be singing a song today that um, is, is separate from the hymnal. So you want to make sure you have that. But we'll also be collecting it in a box on your way out. The box says recycle because we will reuse them. Um, as far as other announcements, you can find some on the back of your bulletin. Today is graduation Sunday, so we're going to be celebrating the graduation of some of the folks from our congregation. And there's a devotional and newsletter available for you in the narthex as well. Doreen is going to be meeting with people in the choir. And you may even be doing some singing today. We're going to have some special music coming up on July 11th and then maybe a little bit after that. Um, the grief group is going to be starting in July. Everybody who feels like they might want to come to that is invited to come because grief has no timetable and you know it's it's with you for for many many years so whether you're grieving because of a loss this past year or one that took place several years ago you are welcome to join us for that the water sermon series will be ending with a baptismal remembrance that's just a little liturgy where we remember that god loves us and the grace of god and that we're baptized that's on july 11th we'll also be doing some kayaking at loyal hannah lake Vacation Bible School is coming up soon, so if you know anybody who would like to attend, you'll want to let Donna know. And a huge and big thank you for everyone who uh, worked at and supported the drive through mission dinner. As you can see, it was an amazing and uplifting time. We were just so pleased to be serving people who were not just part of our church, but rather part of our community. I think part of it was some people who had come to the rummage sale got a flyer about the dinner and then they came back. So we were really truly serving some of the people who uh, may have needed a little help um, and we served you and you were so generous with your giving and the event made over um, $1,060 and that money will be going to the Hope Center that is in Tarentum. So thanks to everybody who gave us a donation and helped us to serve the folks who were coming, who were uh, maybe not able to pay or not um, just wanted to come to the church for the dinner. So thank you for that. And finally, we are going to be doing a sponsorship of a couple of counselors at Pine Springs, and Libby is going to tell us a little bit about that. This year, the deacons are sponsoring two counselors up at Pine Springs Camp, uh, identical twins, Jess and Dana Ewing. Uh, we will be taking monetary donations, so that way we can uh, buy them gift cards for eating on the weekends, for gas money to and from camp, etc. If you are interested in donating, there will be a deacon's box in the narthex. Uh, put just... Pine Springs <laughs> counselor sponsorship on the envelope that you're donating with. And we are also asking for notes of encouragement for them as they take on this huge summer. Um, their address will be posted in the bulletin next week. And we look forward to seeing what you guys are able to contribute. Thank you. Thanks Libby and thanks Deacons for helping those who are working at Pine Springs Camp so that more children can have a vital encounter with Jesus Christ. And that's for the older kids who are the camper or the uh, counselors as well as the younger kids who are the campers. Are there any other announcements in the life of the church this morning? Okay. <sighs> then let's take just a moment as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and in that day, you will say, We give thanks and call upon the name of the Lord. May his deeds be known among the nations. Let us worship the Lord our God. Let us pray. O oh God, as you once claimed us in the Spirit's waters, number us among your own beloved. Give us the power to do your work, to show your love, and to live holy and joyful lives. Keep us faithful in storms and in chaos until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with you and all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God, we know that Jesus offers living water, but time and time again, we turn away from things that don't satisfy. We know that with the waters of baptism, you have made unclean us, but we fail to claim your ways and your truth. In repentance, we ask you to forgive us, set us once again on a holy path that leads to you. Hear us now as we silently confess the things we have done and the good things we have left undone. And now hear the good news as people born of water and spirit, we have died to our old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day, not because we earn it, but because of who God is. So today, remember your baptism, remember the good news as we say together the good news of the gospel. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. You may be seated. And will the children please come forward? about Jesus and water. We've been talking a lot about water these last few weeks, so I thought we'd play a little game of sink or float, okay? Now my stuff, my things are behind you, so I'm gonna grab them. Do you wanna come up and put one of these in and tell me whether you think it'll sink or float? You wanna go? Okay. He thinks it's gonna float, what do you say? It floats, yes. What would you like to pick? You want that one? What do you think? Well, whoops. Well, you know what? It's hanging out there on the side, but it floats, doesn't it? Yeah, do you want to do one, Sammy? Which one do you want to pick, sink or float? You think sink? Oh, that piece of wood floats. We got one more. One more. I'm gonna, it's okay, I'm gonna put it in. What do you think, sink or float? You think it's gonna float? Everything's floated so far, we'll see. You were right, how about that? Everything I picked today floated. All right, since you guys all have tennis shoes, I'm gonna have to do this one myself. What do you think about me? <laughs> do you think I'm gonna sink or float? You think I'm gonna stand on this water, and you think I'm gonna be on top of it, and I'm gonna float. You think I'm gonna sink. Well, you know what? This is, we're gonna do some science, right? We're gonna, we're gonna test these hypotheses about sink or float with Pastor Sue. Ready? And I'm gonna try to step on here. Ooh, here we go. what I do? I sink. Maybe if I try, you think if I try my other foot, that would work better? You think I'll sink again? Well, you know, as good scientists, we always repeat our experiment, make sure we get the same result, right? Here we go. Oh, uh, I sink again. That's a bummer. Well, the reason we were playing sink or float this morning is because we're gonna hear a story about some people who were out in a boat. Jesus' disciples were out in a boat and the, and the wind was there and the water was there and Jesus comes to them, but he was not sinking. He was walking on the water, which is amazing. So I, when Ms. Kim is reading, I want you to listen to that story about how Jesus is so powerful and so special that he does not sink when he is on the water. He can choose to walk on the water because Jesus is, is part of God and God was the one who made the water. So all Jesus can do that because he is such a special person and he loves us. So we're also gonna hear about another guy. His name is Peter and Peter was like me. He didn't walk on the water very long. He kind of just started to sink as well. So. We remember that Jesus is powerful, Jesus is a creator, and Jesus is a miracle worker, and he can walk on water. So, let's pray. Lord, we give thanks for Jesus, who can do so many amazing things. We give thanks that he can walk on water. We give thanks that he loves us, and we pray that we will get to know him better each day. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And may the children of God together say, Amen. Thank you for coming. My feet are still wet. Sticky. Please 
please pray with me. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first scripture reading from the Old Testament is from the book of Jonah. It's verses 1 through 6 and 11 through 16. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will ha give a thought to us that we may not perish. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. <laughs> Sorry. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Our New Testament reading is from Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out of fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we are continuing our sermon series on water, and as we've seen over the last few weeks, water can be used for purification, it can be used for healing, water is used in creation, and in today's story, we can see the sea, or the, the water that is in the sea, and oftentimes it represents chaos and change. So there's a lot we can learn from this story when it applies to even our own lives. Because it's a story about being far from what we have known. It's a story about feeling like we are alone. It's a story about faith and a story about fear. 
and it's a story about doubt. But it's also a story about being bold and trying something that is seemingly beyond our capabilities. So it, 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 at its heart is a story about change. And we see that things are changing right off the bat in this story. Uh, in verse 22, when Jesus says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. So as the story is opening, Jesus has put the disciples in the boat and he's sending them off. Catch up with you later is something he might have said to them. So off they go, separated from Jesus, alone and drifting in a boat. The boat seems to be being pushed by the wind and the waves and not heading anywhere in particular. I can remember myself dropping my kids off at college for that first time, taking them to this other place where they would begin to live independently. We knew where they were going physically. We knew we could type the address in the GPS and we got lots of paperwork from the school to tell us exactly where to go and to what to do. We had all the move-in instructions, but we weren't sure where they were going symbolically or in the big cosmic picture of their lives as they had reached this turning point between high school and, graduate, and college. So we helped them unload their stuff into their room and drove away. And it wasn't until we were headed out that the tears would start for me. I didn't want them to see me crying while I was dropping them off because I wanted them to feel confident about being independent and going on with, to the next phase of their lives. Or maybe you remember this experience from the other point of view, being the one who got dropped off at school, watching your parents drive away and moving into that apartment the first time as a young adult and suddenly there you are in your own room because it's exhilarating. You can have all the lucky charms you want for dinner and nobody's gonna criticize you. You can drink as much Pepsi at breakfast and nobody's gonna say a word. But as a parent, I have learned that the thrill of being out on one's own is sometimes overwhelming for young adults. I don't know what I'm doing, sometimes my kids would say, especially after they graduated from college. I don't know what I'm supposed to be. I don't know where my life is going. There were so many big questions. I don't know what to do with my life. And so what I basically tell them is welcome to adulting. Because there are a whole lot of moments in all of our lives that we feel this uncertainty and fear about what is coming next. It's not just a time of early adulthood or graduation. Our lives are filled with times that we go from one side to the other. Maybe it's when we take a new job Maybe it's moving across the country or from one country to another as a soldier. Maybe it's one side of our life and our work before COVID or the heart attack or the whatever, and then the life and work after that. Or maybe your other side is the loss of a beloved spouse or going from being a couple to becoming a couple with children. As a church, we're going from one side to the other, just like the disciples in this story. As you begin to call a new pastor, you're in the in-between time, the interim time, which is why I am here. So life is about going from one side to the other in a lot of different ways. Life and growth are always about change. And I wanna make an important point about this passage. The disciples didn't decide to get in the boat on their own and leave. Verse 22 says Jesus made them get in the boat and go ahead of them. Sometimes going to the other side is not something we have a choice about. We don't want to go to the other side, especially when it is the death of a loved one or a health crisis. We don't have a choice, but we are still on that journey. And in this story, it's the sea that is between one side and the other side. 
It is the sea that is between where they have been and where they are going. And in um, Jesus' time and before, the sea was often a symbol for chaos and confusion and change. The sea also could have been a um, symbol for another God. So when, when God parts the seas or when Jesus walks on water, it's a way of exalting Jesus and showing how powerful he truly is. And even today, if we think about it, we, we, you've probably heard the phrase, the sea of change, right? That We use that word still today to talk about a big change that happens in our lives or in our world. We face seas of change in our lives all the time. We have to go from one side to the other. And sometimes, truly, it can be smooth sailing, right? We just kind of get in the boat and get from point A to point B without much interference or a care in the world. But other times, that journey is difficult because the sea is choppy, the wind is strong, and the boat that we are in is just seeming to move here and there, and we don't feel like we have any control about where the boat is going. But at least the boat floats and keeps us safe. In this story, the disciples are in a boat, and they're in some choppy waters, and it's dark. The wind took the boat out onto the Sea of Galilee, a considerable distance from the land, and Jesus was up on that hillside praying for a really long time because it says that he, he doesn't even come down until it's almost dawn. So here we are, we've got the disciples in the boat and Jesus on the land. What's the Son of God to do when his ride has left in the middle of the night? There is no Uber of the sea. We don't have the lift of the lake. There's no app to get a ride to that boat that is somewhere out in the middle of the lake. So Jesus does what Jesus does, and he decides, I'll just walk. So he walks on the water. Now, the disciples have never seen this, and they were, of course, terrified, because here comes a person walking on the water toward their boat. Things were already bad enough because it's the middle of the night, it's dark, the water's choppy, they don't know where they're going, and they look and they say, oh my goodness, to make things worse, here is a ghost coming to get us. But it was not a ghost. Jesus reassures them it's him, but they're skeptical, right? So Peter says, call out, call me out to you, call me if it is truly you. So Jesus says to Peter, come to step out of the boat and meet him on top of the water and the waves while the wind is blowing in his face. And this, to me, is the incredible thing. Peter actually does it. Peter had enough faith to get down out of the boat and walk toward Jesus. And here is the miracle right here in the middle of verse 29. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. Now we oftentimes hear this uh, story as a miracle story of Jesus walking on the water or controlling the storm. And maybe it's because I'm a lifelong Christian. Maybe it's because I've heard this story a lot of times. I totally expect Jesus can walk on water. That is something that Jesus is capable of and Jesus can do. But Peter is a disciple who makes a lot of mistakes. I do not expect Peter to walk on water. But there it is. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came to Jesus. And what strikes me is not that the Son of Man, the smartest, most powerful uh, being in the universe, Jesus walked on water. For me, the miracle is that Peter walked on water. When Jesus said, come, Peter got out of the boat. He took a few steps toward Jesus before his fear got the worst of him and he realized just how crazy it was. Peter walked on the water when Jesus called him, but then as he was walking, he noticed that the wind was coming and the waves were big and his fear started to take hold of where he was and then suddenly his fear was bigger than his faith and he started to sink. 
To read this story as simply Peter's failure to have enough faith does not give Peter enough credit. The man got out of the boat and he walked on water. Sure, it may have only been a couple of steps, but it's probably more than you or I have ever done. For that brief moment, Peter was able to rise above the wind and the waves. For a few steps, Peter was able to stand above the chaos that was swirling at his feet. And so as, as we are crossing the sea, as we are going from one side to the other, whether it's a graduation thing or a learning to live without your spouse or being a church officer and trying to figure out the best steps for hiring a new pastor or uh, being the church after the pandemic. Remember Peter stepped out of the boat when Jesus said come. And so I would suggest that maybe we are occasionally supposed to try the impossible that we too are supposed to step out when Peter says come or when Jesus says come. We are supposed to leave the safety of the boat. We are supposed to confront the chaos of our lives. We are supposed to be bold enough to take some steps in a different direction. And this is a great story. And, and imagine how easy it would be to preach this story if Peter walked on water and he stayed afloat the whole time. The message could be, you could do anything you want if you just have enough faith. But it's not that simple, is it? Verse 30 comes, and so does the wind. Verse 30 says, he saw the wind, was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Peter took those bold steps on the water. His fear and anxiety rose up when he felt the wind and he started to sink. You and I will sink. Because Peter is not Jesus, we are not Jesus. Like you and me, Peter's faith and actions are imperfect. And here's some information we don't get from the passage that I really wish that we did. How far did Peter sink? How far into the water did he actually get before he said, Lord, save me? Was he um, down to his knees when panic set in and maybe Jesus took him by the elbow, like at a prom escort, you know, just kind of walking him toward the boat? Or did he get as far as his waist and Jesus was pulling him over towards the boat and helping him in? Or did Peter really sink far? Was his... Was, was he down at the bottom in the muck and the mud? And Jesus had to reach way down and pull him up, sputtering and coughing and throw him back in the boat. How far did Peter sink? How far do we sometimes sink? We, you and I, are Peter. The big picture of our lives oftentimes looks like this story. We step out of the boat, and for a few glorious moments, it feels like we can walk on water. We are bold and we're confident. We keep our eyes on Jesus. Life is good. Our faith is strong. We are, we are blessed. Then the wind comes, and the waves come, and they make it hard to stand. And before we know it, we're sinking and doubting. We think we might be able to get back up on our own, but then we end up just splashing water and sinking even faster. The safety of the boat is out of reach. Our eyes are wide with terror because we don't think we'll be able to make it to the boat, let alone get to the other side. And finally, when we realize we can't do it, we can't get into the boat, we can't get to the other side, we get to the bottom and we say, Lord, save me. And verse 31 says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, why did you doubt? There are moments when our faith is small and our fear is big. And those are the moments when Jesus will reach out his hand and catch us. And it doesn't matter how far down or under we have gone. Jesus pulls us out of the waves and out of the chaos. Jesus makes sure we get into the boat and back 
to the other side. Jesus makes sure of this even though we may doubt. So if you are going through a big change, if you are graduating and going to another side, if your boat is starting to rock, remember this story. It's possible that amid the wind and waves, Jesus will call you out of the safety of the boat and right into the chaos and the sea of change. Jesus will call you, us, away from what we know and directly into the choppy water and he will say, come, get out of the boat and meet some new friends. Get out of the boat and take that job that seems like you're not qualified for. Get out of the boat and try doing some of the things that you enjoy doing with your spouse. Get out of the boat and face the choppy waters. Step out knowing that Jesus is already standing there for you. That even if you're full of doubt and fear, Jesus will take you by the hand and go with you. And the other important lesson in this is when we step out of the boat and things don't go right, we need to know when to ask for help. It's okay to fear. It's okay to have doubt. It's okay to not know where you're going. But we have to reach out and ask for help. Lord, save me, Peter says. And we can certainly cry out to Jesus and Jesus will be there. But we have a room full of people who will be there as well when we cry out for help. Because we seek to model ourselves after Jesus. Sometimes the church is called the, hand and the, the hands and the feet of Jesus. When we need help, we, Christ's people, are the ones that reach out. So the story as it ends, we see in it that the wind dies down, the disciples are amazed at what happens. When Jesus brings Peter back into the boat, all wet from having sunk in the water, maybe even thinking of himself as a failure, when Jesus brings Peter back into the boat and the wind dies down, all the other disciples worship Jesus, saying, truly you are the Son of God. And this story that shows us that Jesus has power over creation, and that's how he is the Son of God. But it also shows us that he is calling us to go out into a difficult world to get out of the boat and go with him. That's how he is like the son of God. This story shows us Jesus' compassion for those who are sinking and filled with doubt. That's how Jesus is like the son of God. And in the end, Jesus and the disciples in their little boat do make it safely across to the other side. They've crossed over to the new place and started ministering to new people. And that's in a way where we are. We're living through a sea of change personally with graduations or jobs or births or deaths. We're living through a sea of change in the church between permanent pastors. We're living through a sea of change with COVID as it changes, the pandemic changes the way we shop and work and where we live. Yes, the winds are blowing, the sea is choppy, and you and I may be weary and frightened and filled with doubt, but the good news is that Jesus is here with us, walking towards us, ready to take us by the hand. Come, Jesus says, calling us out of our safe little boat. He is here with that hand outstretched for you, inviting you to come, take a few steps into the wind, and be part of the miracles that he is doing amidst the chaos of the world that we live in today. Jesus says, come, and will reach out to us when we start to sink. But we need to take the steps. We need to get out of the boat, and we need to try to walk on water. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of Jesus Christ. We know that following him is never easy. 
We know that he calls us and challenges us and saves us, and for that we are grateful. Lord, may we have the boldness of Peter to step out of the boat. May we have the wisdom of Peter to know when to ask for help. And may we have the vision of the disciples who worship Jesus as the Son of God. Amen. now to our time of prayer. Uh, partway through the prayer, I will offer the opportunity for each of you to lift up those who are on your hearts as we bring our joys and concerns before God. Let us pray. Lord, we are here in a time of transition in this your world. So we lift up the changes that are happening in the way that we communicate, the way that we work, the way that we do church, and the way that we live. We pray, Lord, that you will take us by the hand, that you will challenge us, us as we go from one side to the other. God of mercy. Lord, we pray for all of those people and families in the tragic high-rise collapse in Florida that is just unimaginable. We pray for those who are living in the other part of the building and the fear and anxiety for their own safety that they might have. We pray for those who are grieving the loss yet unknown as they are still recovering bodies. Lord, we pray for the safety of all people and all dwellings. We pray this. In Jesus' name, God of mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for those who are in our community and those that we know. We pray for healing for Molly. We lift up Carol and Carl. We pray for Sylvia and Kevin, Greg, Joan, and Dolores and her family and all of those who are in need of healing. We lift up Mary Elizabeth and Jordan and Christian, Judy. We pray for Joe and Bill and Linda and Sharon. We lift up Kim. We pray for Doreen and her eyesight and we pray for Bill. Lord, we pray for all of those who need your healing touch, God of mercy. And Lord, we pray for those whom we lift up to you now. Lord, we pray for each and every one of these people. We pray for uh, what it is that they need, for you know their needs even better than we do. God of mercy. Amen. Lord, we pray for those who cannot be with us today, remembering Kathy and Lois, Claire and Walt. We pray for Pat and Helen and Sherry. We pray, Lord, that they will feel your presence and that we will be the hands and feet of Christ to them. God of mercy. Amen. And finally, God, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, 
And we are going to take this time to recognize our graduates from both 2020 and 2021. Um, you can see the list of them here. They are also in the newsletter, which um, will come to you by email if you get email, and there are some in the Narfex. Um, we definitely want to offer our congratulations to all of these folks, and I think I picked the absolute worst Sunday to do it because while it was wonderful to communicate with everybody, there are so many things going on today um, that it is difficult for many of them to be here. Although I got a lot of texts saying, oh, I'm going to watch it on Facebook or uh, we'll watch it on Facebook Live. So um, I, do you want to come up as, as one of our special graduates? Come on down. Jordan graduated last year, Ryan graduated this year, and Colleen graduated last year and again in August. So um, you, if you have an opportunity, you may want to offer some congratulations to them. But um, Caleb, I have a little card and gift for you. Yes, well, <laughs> you're very welcome. Now, if you don't mind standing here, I just have a few liturgical words to say for you, okay? <laughs> Caleb, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, a unique reflection of God's image. We rejoice that God made you just as you are, and we thank God for all of the gifts that he has given to you and to all of those who are graduating. You have persevered through challenges, refusing to give up despite difficult circumstances. And so we take this time to recognize your tenacity and strength especially during the disruptions of this past year. May you always remember that you have people who love and care for you, people who support you and will be there for you and believe in you whatever, wherever life takes you. We here at Union Presbyterian Church are people who live in hope and in this time of transition as you begin a new phase of your life's journey, the love and hope of Jesus Christ from this church go with you. We know that the road ahead will not always be smooth or easy or maybe even obvious, but we have faith that God's sure presence will be with you. We pray that you will remember to ask for help when you need it, that you will accept and extend mercy often and practice courageous kindness always. When you're anxious or afraid or unsure or struggling, we want you to know that you have a home in Jesus Christ here in this church. And those of us who are gathered here today want you to know how valuable you are to us and to God. You, each of you who has graduated, are irreplaceable. And while we are proud of your graduation, you are loved for who you are not what you accomplish. So today, I pray that God's blessing goes with you, that God's grace flows from you, and that God's peace lives within you. Amen. And congratulations. Thanks. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, 
All that we have actually comes from you. And so we return these gifts to you that your kingdom may come here on earth and that we may be part of the upbuilding of your kingdom. Amen. just a minute. A lot of churches are built with architecture that resembles a boat. Did you know that? Not all of them, but some of them. We're in the boat. In just a few minutes, what are you going to do? You're going to step out of the boat. And guess who is out there in that crazy, windy, wavy, and turbulent wor world? Jesus is out there. And so be bold, ask for help when you need it, and take that hand of Jesus in our crazy, mixed up world, because he is there for you, and he is your savior. And now may God bless you and keep you, may God's face shine upon you and give you peace, as together we sing, amen. amen. amen.